Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vancouver Coastal Health South Sunshine Coast Open Board Forum. I think it's quite a long time since we've had a forum in the, on the Sunshine Coast, and we're delighted to be here tonight. My name is Dr. Penny Ballum, and I'm the chair of the Vancouver Coast Health, Coastal Health Board of Directors, and very privileged and delighted to be your host tonight. This is a time where we can get together um, and, and talk about, we can help share information with all of you from our, our public on the Sunshine Coast, talk about important updates related to projects and services at the Seashelt Hospital and in the community up and down the, the Sunshine Coast. And, you know, we have a lot of uh, senior members of the senior executive team, our CEO, We've got board members who are here tonight um, and many staff, and we're all here to actually share information and answer your questions and make sure that, you know, we have a chance to hear from you about, you know, things you want to have more information about and any concerns you may have. It's just an open evening for us to, you know, come together with the members of the public on the Sunshine Coast to talk together about Vancouver Coastal Health, our services, and how we're doing. Before we, we uh, I'm just going to have a little technical um, thing that I want to put right up front. You know, this for those of you who have been on one of these calls before, um, as you know, we do a phone out to let everyone know. And my understanding from Converso, who is our, our technical um, lead on this, that we, we had some technical difficulties with the call display that went out to some community members. We heard from some people to let them, who let us know that when we rang, there was the name of something that had nothing to do with Vancouver Coastal Health came up on your call display. That, that issue should not have happened. It's a, it's a technical sort of telecommunications internet issue. Um, it's now been resolved and we really apologize. Uh, we're not not happy that that happened, but we appreciate those of you who did let us know and that allowed us to resolve it. And we really appreciate that you're all here with us tonight. Before we hear from our speakers, um, it's really important for us to begin our evening by, by recognizing that the region we're discussing tonight are the traditional unceded territory of the Shasta First Nation. We are committed at BCH to delivering care for a total of about 1.25 million people in our geographic area of Vancouver Coastal. And on that area are the traditional unceded territories of 14 First Nations. And this year marks the 60th anniversary of the Shasha Nation gifting the land for Seashell Hospital to, at that point, the government of the day. And that allowed the move of the hospital from Garden Bay to its current very central location in Seafelt. That gift was an extraordinarily generous gift for the land to be made available for the operations of the hospital. And this hospital of Seashelt has served the Sunshine Coast community since 1964. And that gift was particularly momentous, you know, given the what we are all learning about the painful history tied to residential school that was formerly operated on this land. We are very dedicated to our partnership with the Shishas Nation and to the continuous work that we're doing to build a culturally safe healthcare system that allows our Indigenous people to come and get care feel safe, have the best quality care provided for them, to not be subjected to race, racism, and to make it, you know, the health care as accessible for everyone as possible. In February 2023, VCH signed a Memorandum of Understanding with the Shifas First Nation to reflect our ongoing partnership and our commitment to both reconciliation and to working together to plan services for the territory. And we are actively meeting leadership to leadership to advance the healthcare priorities in this territory. 
So we're very, very grateful. And before we move to our first speaker, which is going to be a public health update by our medical health officer, I'd like to welcome the Hewis Rochelle Jones, counselor from the Shisha Nathan, to help start our discussion in a good way. Ahewis Rochelle, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Ballum. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, Itanana CEIA or Shiel Chen Squish or Shiel Chen Squish, Hehewo Shisha Nation. Mewela, Mewela, Emosh, Emosh, Tuk Misiaya. Good evening, everyone. My, ancest my ancestral name is Oshiel. My given English name is Rochelle Jones, proud Shishat elected member of the Shishat Nation Council. I bring welcome uh, wishes to our Suya on behalf of Swahewus, Lenora Joe, and Hehewus, the Chief and Council of the Shishat Nation. First of all, I acknowledge all the elders and friends of this community and thank you to the organizers for having me provide welcome to you all. Thank you, all Noms, for participating with our neighbors and friends and our partners, Vancouver, Vancouver Coastal Health Authority. May we all come together and hear words with open hearts and open minds. All Noms, Chalap. All Noms. Muted, Penny. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, hey, with Rochelle, we really appreciate you being here. Um, it has been a real privilege for me as the chair of Vancouver Coastal to participate in some of the leadership to leadership meetings as we work our way through, first of all, recognizing and acknowledging the donation of land for the hospital and looking forward to a celebration in November of that gifting, um, but to better understand the needs of the whole community um, of the Sunshine Coast and, and the nation in particular, and to help, you know, start the, you know, the process of, you know, continuing to enhance health services for the whole community. So our first presentation at these meetings is always um, from public health. And I just want to, for, for the public who are here, and thank you so much for being here. And what we know is people continue to join. So I'll just say, what we normally do is we, we have um, a presentation from public health who, who provides for you just an update on how, how is the public health, the population, health of the population in the geographic area that we're meeting with and give you some insight into you know, successes, challenges, things that all of us should be thinking about in our families, with our kids and grandkids, with our seniors, just things that are going on that are really important for us to understand. So we're very lucky to have um, our medical health officer, Dr. Malili Kukwetla here, and we have Dr. Patty Daly here, who's our chief medical health officer tonight. And we feel that this is a very, very important part of this meeting. And so what we'll do is we'll, we want to hear from you tonight after you've heard the presentation and you will be able to ask a question at any time. In order to ask a question, you can press star three on your phone keypad. That will connect you to an operator who will take down your question and check if you want to ask it live or have us read it aloud and put you in the line for the question and answer periods that are throughout the call. Um, and the first one will be after our public health session. So there'll be lots of time for question and answers. That's what we like about these sessions. They allow you to bring your questions forward and you know we do our best to answer them. And if we can't answer them, um, we'll, we'll get back to you. And sometimes you know, people have um, you know, more individual questions and sometimes we say, okay, well, we'll get our, you know, one of our senior staff to phone you back after the call. But most of the time, we're very, very happy to try and answer your questions during the session. So try to keep your question brief. There's lots of people joining us tonight and we want to 
get as many questions as possible. And some of you have already sent in questions, and some of those questions we're going to try and answer in the course of the presentations. But otherwise, we will also be reading out some of those questions that have come in. We also provide audience polls throughout the event that you can, use, you can answer using your phone. And these polls are just designed to give us a bit of a high-level snapshot of your perspectives on healthcare priorities, some of which we're going to discuss this evening. We listen to the polls with keen interest, but they actually don't replace proper engagement with community, like you know, hearing your in-person questions and answers, and the work that we do on an ongoing basis with the nations, with the staff, and with the public. So there's many different ways that we engage with our public, and this is just one of them. But for, for us who are the chair and directors on the board, it's a really important opportunity for us. So we're gonna dive into the first poll of the evening. I'm gonna ask a question, read out four answers, and you can select the number on your phone keypad that best reflects your opinion. And so just if you could listen to all of the answers before you make your selection, that would be great. So our first poll question is, which healthcare priority in the South Sunshine Coast is most important to you? Press one for hospital care, including emergency department care. Press two, for primary care and family doctors. Press three for seniors care. And press four for mental health services and support. So once again, the question is, which healthcare priority is most important to you in the South Sunshine Coast? Number one, for hospital, including emergency department. Press two for primary care and family doctors. Press three for seniors care, and press four for mental health services and supports. So thank you for participating. All you have to do is press those numbers on your phone, and we'll have the results from the poll for you in a minute. And I just will remind you that you can get in line to ask a question at any time by pressing star three on your phone pad. If you have something to write on that's handy to you, that will be great. We'll be sharing information for many different resources and services. And if you miss anything that we're speaking about tonight, the event is being recorded and it will be made publicly available on the VCH website shortly after it's ended. So that, that allows you to, to have a chance, um, you know, to make sure that you can listen up and make some notes to ask a question or to take away with you, to talk with your family. But if you miss it, don't worry, it will be on our website. So we have the results now of our first poll. So 20% of our attendees picked hospital care as the most important to you on the Sunshine Coast. 60% picked primary care. We certainly understand that. 16% picked seniors care. And 7% picked mental health and substance use. So that simple poll alone gives us a lot of insight into the things that you're worrying about and want to ask us questions about. And, you know, that would, I would say, having looked at the three questions that people did send in to us, that very much reflects the kinds of questions we got um, by people who sent their questions in already. So hopefully we'll address some of these issues and then we'll have lots of time for you to ask your questions. So thanks for everyone who participated in the first poll. We really appreciate your feedback. And now I'm going to invite Dr. Kiketla, our medical health officer for the Sunshine Coast. And Dr. Kiketla, hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bellum. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to be uh, joining you this evening as not just the medical health officer covering Sunshine Coast and uh, the rest of Coastal Rural, but also as a proud resident of the Sunshine Coast region. Uh, I'm also, I acknowledge that I do have some colleagues who are uh, joining us today as well. Uh, and before I get into the content of um, our conversation this evening from a public health perspective, uh, I would like to 
uh, express my gratitude as well to Hehewis uh, for the um, incredible welcome and starting us off in a good way this evening. Uh, and I thank the audience as well for making time for our conversation. Uh, as I'm sure uh, a lot of people know uh, on the call and, and in the audience, uh, public health is a small but mighty part of a healthcare system uh, that focuses on the overall health and well-being uh, of the entire population. Uh, we're a small team uh, of medical health offices that work with various stakeholders, uh, both within and outside of the healthcare system, including uh, with uh, community partners and, and local governments uh, on various aspects of, of improvement and promotion of the health of the population. Uh, and that ranges from disease and injury prevention, health promotion efforts, uh, protection from environmental hazards. Uh, but a key aspect of the work that we do as well uh, is really looking at those uh, determinants of health that are outside of the medical or healthcare system that directly influence uh, uh, the, the uh, health outcomes within the population. Uh, and we work with various um, uh, uh, partners that include uh, public health nurses, uh, shout out to our public health nurses who do an amazing job, uh, our environmental health officers, uh, policy experts, and, and a variety of, of uh, 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 different colleagues. Uh, so it's within that brief context today uh, that I'm uh, going to be providing highlights on just three uh, areas uh, of um, uh, updates that are relevant to our communities on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, one will be uh, just a quick recap of where we are in terms of the respiratory season and how it's impacted us. Uh, the second is going to be uh, an ongoing challenge around the drug overdose response uh, within our communities and how it's impacting the Sunshine Coast. Uh, and then I also will uh, briefly highlight uh, another ongoing uh, emergency that uh, is the climate change uh, impacts on our communities. So starting with the viral respiratory illnesses, uh, every respiratory season, as you know, uh, we experience circulating viruses uh, that include seasonal influenza, RSV, uh, rhinoviruses, enteroviruses. And as we've uh, come to, to uh, know over the past uh, few years, uh, SARS coronavirus 2, also known as COVID-19. Uh, and the current season has not been different. We're still in it, uh, although we're, uh, uh, not as where we were a few months ago. Um, we've seen all those, the, the, those viruses circulating. Uh, for influenza, we started uh, seeing it uh, get into our communities around September and October, uh, and we reached a peak uh, in terms of activity um, in late December, early January. Uh, and really the most uh, 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 detected influenza type has been predominantly influenza A. Uh, out of all the, the testing that's been done for um, uh, samples that have been done within the communities. Uh, and since then, we've continued to see uh, a decrease in terms of uh, the, the levels of influenza that are circulating in the communities, and we're certainly seeing a downward trend there. Uh, uh, RSV, which is the other virus, has continued uh, and, and followed a similar pattern since October and November when we um, uh, reached a peak, and we're now uh, showing a downward trend as well. Uh, in terms of COVID-19, uh, it has been in the background, uh, I think, as we're all aware, to varying extents throughout the month. Uh, we did see um, uh, most of the activity a little bit earlier around uh, September uh, and October, uh, around which time then we were able to get the latest COVID-19 vaccines uh, into communities. Uh, and uh, as a result uh, of the vaccine coverage, as well as natural immunity that we've um, uh, now accumulated over uh, the past few years. Uh, thankfully, most of the cases uh, for COVID-19 have generally been mild um, and most people avoiding hospitalization uh, and, and mortality. Uh, and since then, uh, generally, when we look at hospital admissions, critical care admissions and deaths, uh, those have remained um, generally stable since around uh, uh, early February. And I think when we look at our uh, wastewater surveillance, which is also another useful tool that we've uh, been able to implement um, during the pandemic, uh, that that's, those levels have generally been stable um, as well. Um, and then, of course, we still have uh, uh, enteroviruses, rhinoviruses that cause uh, cold-like symptoms. Uh, and I think those of us who have children uh, are well aware of that. And that seems to be, uh, that's not unusual uh, given the current um, season. 
Uh, and I, I want to take this opportunity to remind uh, our uh, residents uh, within the community about the importance of vaccines. Uh, I think people would be aware uh, that um, our, uh, there was a, an announcement around uh, a measles case that was detected uh, within Vancouver Coastal uh, Health. It was outside of the Sunshine Coast. Uh, however, uh, details were, were available publicly, uh, and this is related to international travel. But I think it's a, a good reminder of the importance of vaccines as, as uh, prevention tools, uh, particularly for uh, our children. Uh, and so uh, just a reminder uh, to ensure that uh, people are up to date with all of the vaccines for which they're eligible. Um, fortunately, with that specific case, although we're still uh, doing some follow-up, we have not seen any evidence of local uh, spread beyond that uh, that case uh, until today. Um, and for the Sunshine Coast in particular, uh, in response to uh, uh, that specific investigation, we were able to ramp up uh, availability uh, and, uh, and access to vaccines by stepping up additional clinics uh, in both Seashelt and Gibson's. Uh, including over the weekend. So uh, that was really tremendous work and we were able to reach some people uh, who had not yet been immunized. So that was a really good uh, success story. Um, and uh, if people are still interested in getting immunized or getting their children immunized, uh, we do have the ability for booking online uh, through the VCH Jane app site as well as, uh, or, or people can just call, uh, call the local health unit and we'll be able to get them in. Uh, I'll switch gears a bit and talk about the uh, overdose, uh, uh, the drug overdose emergency, which is uh, one that is that we're all uh, familiar with, um, and it's another important uh, public health issue that still continues to impact our communities, including here on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, as we all know, last year uh, continued uh, to be a challenge for us in the province in terms of the numbers of people who. Um, uh, have died from uh, drug overdose, drug overdoses. Uh, and on the Sunshine Coast, when we look at over the past few years, we have been impacted as well. Uh, compared to other places, uh, you know, such as the downtown east side, it looks like we're not doing that bad, but these are people's lives and, and these are uh, um, still continuing to impact our communities. Uh, we, we did see some uh, stabilization in terms of the number of deaths on, on the Sunshine Coast uh, over the past, over the, between 2021 to 2022. And then last year, we did see a bit of an increase uh, within the community. So I think this still shows that this is an existing threat uh, for us uh, and really close to home. Uh, but I also want to highlight that the range of services that have been impacted within uh, the Sunshine Coast community have really uh, uh, helped and they continue to help save lives. Uh, and uh, I, I'd like to highlight the uh, overdose prevention site in, in Seashell. Uh, and we have been uh, and continue to monitor the number of visits to that specific site. Um, and it really demonstrates that there is a continued need for that uh, and that it is saving lives um, because I think without it, we would see a, a much higher number of deaths. Uh, and of course, that is just one aspect of the range of services. And you'll hear uh, about some of those um, as we continue our conversation this evening uh, that include outreach services, mental health and, and substance use supports. Uh, services, uh, uh, oat uh, therapy, naloxone, and uh, and uh, um, and many others. Uh, one that I would also like to highlight is the, the um, demonstration of partnership between communities, where we've been able to uh, partner with Cassette uh, with their drug checking service, uh, so, uh, and we've been able to uh, send our samples there, uh, and people are able to get a very quick response in terms of. Uh, the components that are within their uh, drugs before they uh, consume so that they can assess their level of risk. But it's also been helpful in terms of us as a system being able to uh, send out messages uh, to folks if there's an indication that there's a higher risk uh, of contamination within drugs that are circulating within the community. So as a form of harm reduction, uh, very helpful. Um, and then uh, I will uh, switch gears as well uh, just to highlight one uh, important aspect, and that's uh, the um, one important uh, report, sorry, uh, and that's uh, recently been released out of the uh, Office of the Chief Medical Health Officer within our VCH uh, community, and it was released uh, last month, so it's hot off the press, but it is uh, publicly available online uh, on our vch.ca site. Uh, 
Um, and this is an important and timely report that describes the impact of this urgent public health issue uh, within our Vancouver coastal health communities. Now, I know people have heard uh, and have read uh, various different reports around climate change and, and health impacts, uh, but I think this one is, is really unique and, and distinct uh, in that it provides us with local information uh, from our health uh, authority specifically, and it, it highlights uh, how different communities are being impacted, uh, including um, for our community on the Sunshine Coast, uh, examples such as the severe drought uh, that we had that went on forever uh, not too long ago. Uh, the impact of water restrictions uh, it, uh, are clearly outlined as well in there. Uh, and secondly, it also provides uh, really practical recommendations about what measures can be taken towards adaptation that'll protect the health of the population um, as this uh, threat continues. Uh, and, and certainly since I've been in this role uh, on the Sunshine Coast, I have been uh, impressed by the collaborative approach that's been demonstrated uh, by community leaders as we work with them uh, in terms of exploring solutions around sustainable water sources, um, and the work that our teams in, in population public health have been able to support around uh, the water storage uh, project uh, that is uh, 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 being planned for and, and uh, proposed, uh, the planning and response to extreme weather events, and other efforts around uh, mitigation, including um, advocacy for safe and active transportation uh, across the Sunshine Coast. Uh, and I think also, the other thing that uh, stands out for me in terms of this report, which I encourage people to read, is that it really emphasizes the importance of Indigenous uh, knowledge uh, and leadership in our understanding of and in our response to the critical climate-related uh, changes that continue to impact and that will continue to impact us for the foreseeable future. So I encourage all of you to uh, try and find it on vch.ca. Uh, if you just Google the Chief Medical Health Officer report, um, there'll be a link there that uh, will enable you to download it. Uh, and if, if, if you have time uh, to just focus even on the recommendations, I think that would be very helpful and hopefully will uh, spark conversation about how we can all do our part to, um, towards adaptation. Uh, and with that, Dr. Bellum, I think I will hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kakela. A really a great overview of important things for our community. Um, I'm glad we touched on the measles problem. Measles is a nasty little virus that, you know, is um, not something that we want our children to be exposed to unprotected. So we really want to encourage vaccination of our kids um, to get all their various protections in, on board. So thanks so much. Um, we're going to take our first audience questions this evening. So I just want to remind everyone, if you wish to ask a question, um, press star three on your phone at any time, and that will connect you to an operator who will take down your question, and you can be able to indicate if you wish to present the question yourself or have the operator read it out for me. So um, we are taking questions that, as I mentioned earlier, that were pre-submitted as well as those that are coming in online and by callers who are participating in this event in real time. So let's, let's move ahead with our first question. So our first question is from Paula. Paula, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for doing this Welcome. tonight. Um, yeah, I guess my first question is about uh, youth on the Sunshine Coast and um, kind of what I'm seeing post-pandemic. Um, I feel like there are so few resources for kids um, for their mental health and uh, for addictions. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of uh, social anxiety, depression, um, you know, they're really struggling post-pandemic, trying to figure out how to be in social circles again, how to deal with their feelings. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's there's kids out there who are using. And it, it seems like the, the things that I've seen is if there's, there's a kid who's addicted here on the Sunshine Coast, they have to be sent uh, off coast. To deal with it and that that's not ideal either 
So I guess I'm just concerned about the mental health of our youth right now. Yeah, thanks so much, Paula. It's a, it's a really important question. I think it, you're not the only one concerned with that. So I'm going to pass this over to Marie. Marie Dupereau, do you want to take that? Yes, thank you. So thank you for that question, Paula. Um, we do have we do have um, a youth a youth team that are um, that are housed in our mental health and substance use program um, here on site in our uh, mental health and 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 uh, buildings on the site of the hospital. And that team is working very closely with, um, with the youth of the, um, of the Sunshine Coast. And we're building those services um, as well as, um, as really connecting in with other community partners. We're also very involved with the development of the foundry that has been, we have been recognized and we have received um, provincial funding, um, which is really, which is really great news for the Sunshine Coast and, and our use of the Sunshine Coast as well. Thanks so much, Marie. Um, I, I don't know, Yasmin, do you, is there anything you want to add? Sure, thank you. Um, just to, to recognize um, that, Paula, what you bring forward, um, you know, that this this is something that we are seeing post-pandemic um, and that, you know, kids you know across the province are really struggling. And in a smaller community, it's even more challenging because, uh, you know, there are resource challenges. And, and so um, I think Marie talking about um, the resource available as well as, you know, the new foundry site to open up. Um, there's also... Um, other sort of online services they're also available which kids tend to you know uh, prefer sometimes just being anonymous but getting some help um, and we've actually set up a brand new website um, which we can uh, send you the link for but it's a VCH website um, it's, you know hashtag on your mind and that actually has a lot of resources that are available to kids doesn't matter where they live um, so that they can get some immediate support um, and then also then you know connect in uh, with the, the resources available um, on the Sunshine Coast. So there's, um, you know, uh, some, some resources from that perspective. And then if you're looking for more details, we're happy to chat with you offline as well, uh, if there's any specific situations that you want help with. And maybe I'll just jump in, Yasmin. Um, so a, a couple of things for our staff, if you wouldn't mind just introducing your position, that would be great, just to give our public who can't see you a sense of who you are. Um, but the Road to Recovery is a major, major provincial initiative designed for young and you know all ages in terms of recovery from addictions there are there there has been you know a significant investment by the government in in starting to build services in in all our communities large and small so i think we're at a very good time right now where there are more resources coming to the health authority to actually set up required services so i appreciate your question and you know i think it's a time of real hope to see more capacity being built to for young people who are feeling, you know, who are affected by by the impact of COVID and other other issues. Okay, we have a question from Howard. Um, there's a shortage of doctors and big wait lists. What is your plan to help with this? Oh, I'm sorry, Howard, you probably wanted to ask that question. You go right ahead. Uh, yeah, well, that's, that's basically it. Uh, I've been living here on the Sunshine Coast for 70 plus years. And uh, my doctor is retiring uh, very shortly, I think in early summer, and I will be for the first time without a, a family doctor in, in all the years yeah. I've lived here. And, uh, you know, I know this is a worldwide problem, it's a nationwide problem. Uh, we tried to address it in Tender Harbor by starting a, a small clinic here that has a staff doctor. Uh, that staff doctor is run ragged because he has to do a very onerous uh, uh, set of rounds at the Health Hospital, as well as how many patients here in our clinic. And uh, we've had a problem with this for years, ever since we built this clinic in the early 70s. Uh, this seems an organizational problem that goes out the clinic. Could look at. Uh, we, we live a long way from Treetop. Uh, it's really hard for so, our doctors to. Wow, 
Howard? There's something needs to be done about yeah. this. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. That's that's really great. So I'm gonna um I, I'm gonna first pass it to Yasmin. She's our VP of community services, primary care, and she can start and then Darlene, you can indicate for me who who might uh, follow up if necessary. Go ahead, Yasmin. Okay. Thank you, Howard. Um so uh, again, uh, yes, you know, um, I think you're right that this is this is this is a uh, larger problem than the Sunshine Coast just around um, access to primary care providers, but it is one that um, you know VCH uh, it takes you know it's, it's been a key priority for us as well as for um, the government, and so a lot of things have happened to um, begin to move the dial on this. Uh, you know, just from the larger perspective, from the ministry perspective, um, there's been a lot of work done with um, you know, the doctors of BC and our, you know, our physicians to really understand what's going to help us bring more providers into the system. And so there's been, you know, look at uh, providing team-based care. So how do we create a team around our, our GPs and our NPs, our nurse practitioners? How do we create a team around them, bring in more nurses, counselors, support so that the doctors can work in a team and, at and attach to more and more uh, patients so so that, you know, individuals in the community who want a doctor would have access to one. So that's being looked at as well as, you know, some of the payment models are also being looked at. Um, and then there's also um, uh, a registry that has also opened up um, through 811 for individuals who are looking for a provider can now put their name down on the registry. Um, and then when there are providers in your community, they would then go to the registry um, to be able to find individuals and, you know, call up and begin to attach. Um, but more locally then, how that sort of um, lands then in the community is that um, there is work happening um, to develop what we call primary care networks. And that happens with the doctors in your community through so the Division of Family Practice and then also with BCH. And the ministry has funded uh, the ability to, to bring on, uh, I believe it's, uh, you know, a, a large, I think it's five more providers or it might be a little bit more than that, uh, GPs, G GPs as well as nurse practitioners, as well as they funded for nurses and counselors to come on board. So there's a lot of work happening now to recruit those individuals, as well as to create a physical location uh, for the PCN to, to provide care. So that is also underway in your community. Um, and then in addition to that, we also recognize that, um, you know, there has been um, new services in the urban areas, the urgent primary care centers. And when those came on board, you know, five years ago, they're really meant to address people's urgent episodic needs. So you've got your doctor you go to regularly. Sometimes people don't have a doctor or can't get to the doctor on the same day. So it's really uh, to look at the urgent episodic need. Those were initially developed in an urban context. We're now hearing five years later um, from the rural communities that, you know, we need something like that here. And so now we're beginning to understand, well, what would that look like in a rural community? Because resources are constrained. And we, when we bring new providers in, we want them to attach to patients, right? But it's also, what do we do? Perhaps how do we also use uh, virtual care? So we're, we're looking at it from that perspective. So a lot of work happening. So I hope that helps. So much, Yasmin. Um, and I've got uh, Vivian or Wayne. Is there anything else you want to add on that? Sure. Yeah, I can, hi, Howard. It's Wayne, uh, the Vice President for the People Team. Um, in the past year, we've also been investing on the recruitment side for our providers, physicians, nurse practitioners, and other um, healthcare providers. Um, and in the Sunshine Coast, please report that we've added and been able to recruit for nine additional physicians in the past 12 months. We're also um, investing and participating in attending conferences um, and other forums where physicians, and in particular physicians who are seeking uh, rural opportunities, um, are there and we're able to um, develop those connections and really promote the uh, benefits of working in areas such as the Sunshine Coast. Thanks so much, Wayne. Uh, thanks, Yasmin. A really important topic. Um, just remember, everyone, to press star three on your phone if you have a question. And the next question is, I'm going to read this because that's what, this was a pre-submitted question, I believe, from Lynn. What are your plans for implementing substantial support for patients and their families using MAID uh, on the Sunshine Coast? So I'm going to pass this to Dr. Peter Edmonds. Dr. Edmonds, are you there? Okay. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I'm here. I'm here. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead, Peter. 
sorry, Penny. Um, I was just struggling to get off mute. So thanks very much. It's a very important question. Um, uh, I, I'd start by saying that MAID, uh, Medical Assisted uh, Death, is a um, fundamental, foundational program to ECH. Very important that we um, we keep our uh, our eye on the the um, the rights of patients in this area, and also on making sure that we don't inconvenience them in any way. So, so we are able uh, to provide made in um, acute care, long term care, and people's private homes on Sunshine Coast. We we do that to focus on matching that to what the patient and the family want more than anything else, and. Uh, um, I don't know of any current barriers to that at the moment, but certainly it's a very important program to us, and we'll continue to to try to um, do better at it. Okay, thanks, thanks, Peter. Um, our okay, so this is here's our last question. So um, from Kathy. So Kathy, you want to ask your question? Sure. I am a retiree, so I'm over the age of 65. Um, am I going to get better health care here on the Sunshine Coast living in Garden Bay, Pender Harbor, or should I be considering a move to Vancouver? What, what's the thoughts here? Is it time for me to move to get better health care where I can get it, or is it okay to stay here and expect to receive it from Seashell Hospital. Well, maybe I'm going to jump in because, you know, I, I think it's a great question. And I feel as the chair, and I can see, Kathy, that I've been in this uh, privilege role for five years now. And I think this is a great time to be retired on the Sunshine Coast. We, we have, a, we've made a lot of investments up and down the coast and, we're continuing to get a lot of support, as you've already heard, from government to build our health systems. Um, Darlene McKinnon, our vice president of the Coastal Community of Care, is going to talk to you about planning around the hospital um, when she's, she's going to be our next speaker. Um, there are, as we talk about mental health services, there's you, you heard about the announcement of the federal government providing some resources, significant resources for seniors care for British Columbia. So there are a lot of really positive things that are happening. So I feel pretty comfortable saying, don't move. You'll never get a more glorious place to live. And um, it's too noisy in Vancouver. And there's lots of great things happening. So that's one of the reasons why we like to have these sessions is to, you know, just help bring you up to date on, on everything that's actually happening. So I'm I'm going to invite one of my fellow board members, uh, Deborah Baker, who's um, a member of the Squamish Nation, to say a few words about healthcare on the Sunshine Coast and to introduce Darlene McKinnon. Go ahead, Deborah. Hello. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. On hot squalls, it's a beautiful day, a beautiful evening. Um, I shared with my colleagues on the board that uh, my mother. My late mother, Marie Baker, Marie Jeffries, um, was from Seashell Nation, and uh, I went to residential school there as well. So I've got some um, some very fond family memories and some not so fond memories of residential school. But I do want to say that um, your questions, your participation in this town hall and other town halls is so important, especially to our board and to our senior staff and to Vancouver Coastal Health overall. So on that note, I'd like to introduce you to Darlene, who works very closely with Coastal Health. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad that we're in good hands with the whole team at Vancouver Coastal Health. So I hope you all have a great evening and stay safe and stay awesome. Thank you, Penny. So much, Deborah. Okay, just before Darlene, I, I open it up to you. Um, I just want to mention the the, um, the incredible Seafelt Hospital Foundation, which we, as a board of directors for VCH, are, are so appreciative, uh, along with the senior leadership team and all of our staff, for the incredible community response 
for the support of the Seafield Hospital Foundation. The foundation raises really important funds. It, it helps make everybody aware of the great things that are going on, and it really helps us do our work delivering safe, high quality care. So I really want to thank all of you who have donated to the foundation and just tell you that every day when we use equipment or we work in renovated rooms that we notice it and we really, really appreciate it. And we see in our every day in our healthcare facilities, volunteers who work in the hospital and just want to say that that time, effort and impact is also you know, felt daily and so much appreciated. Finally, I'm going to thank all of our staff um, and, you know, just tell them how, because I know there are staff that are probably on this call and just thank them for all their great work. And, you know, really know that we know they go above and beyond to deliver care for their community. Um, most of the staff who work on the Sunshine Coast live on the Sunshine Coast, obviously. And it's it's really a wonderful thing to be able to work and care for your community that's small enough that you actually often know each other. So just really want to thank you. So I am going to, um, I'm going to pass it over to Darlene McKinnon, who's the vice president for the coastal community. And we do have another poll and I'm just looking at my folks to see, do you, should we just carry on and we'll do a couple of polls when we get to the end? Yeah, that's great. Okay. So I'm going to ask Darlene to take it away, Darlene. and. Just um, Darlene does a great job and she's going to give you a good overview of, of all the things that are going on across the Vancouver Coastal Services on the Sunshine Coast. So over to you, Darlene. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Deborah, and thanks, Penny. I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us tonight. It's really important to us and it's really a pleasure to be here. I have quite a lot of um, information to share, so I will try to be quick so we, do, we can get to some more questions, but I just wanted to um, share. First, I wanted to start about mass, to talk about master planning. I know that folks have heard about this and I wanted to share that we'll be um, preparing, that we're preparing to start our master uh, planning for the Seashell Hospital. The launch date is April 29th. Uh, and the point or, or the purpose of the master planning is really to look at and plan for the future of the hospital. The goal of master planning is really to understand our service needs and really look at improving our healthcare services in the short and long term and the medium term. We know the Sunshine Coast is a growing community. We know there's a large demographic of seniors and that there are unique challenges when you live in a rural community and that make healthcare access more challenging. And so the plan is to really understand the health service needs and how we meet those needs of the evolving community and the plan will map that out over a 30 year period. This work, which will start on April 29th, is targeted to take about a year. It will review our facilities and our services. It will plan for the population growth. It will plan for the demographics of the community and it will focus on the delivery of culturally safe care in partnership with our Seychelles Nation. And the results of this will be a clinical service plan and a hospital campus plan that reflects the input of the local community. So as part of the process, we'll be engaging with our staff and our medical staff, our uh, First Nations partners, our local elected officials and community partners and the public to understand from you what the community identifies as priorities. And then this information will be considered along best practices for healthcare delivery so that we combine the feedback from the public and from our clinical planners to come up with our clinical service plan. Through the process, we will have opportunities to share information with you. We'll be starting the launch with an online survey for the public, but as we plan and go through this, we will have opportunities for um, focus groups for some of our key partners. We'll bring draft plans back to the community and to share information and receive input. So I just wanted to share that because I know folks have been interested in participating in the master plan. 
I'm now going to talk a little bit about the hospital. I wanted to share about the emergency department renovation. I know many of you are aware of this. The emergency renovation is underway right now. And the point or the purpose of that is to make some immediate improvements to the space to address um, safety and flow and also to improve the patient experience. Um, we're adding in new treatment spaces as part of this renovation. We'll have a dedicated mental health and substance use, substance use assessment room. We'll have a family room so we can have confidential com conversations. There'll also be five additional treatment spaces um, within uh, the renovation. And we're also um, doing a renovation to the triage. And this is being done to improve safety and privacy. During the renovation, the emergency department will remain in full operation during the construction. As you may know, we've set up a mobile medical unit on site that's being used during the renovation to limit disrupt disruptions for patients and staff. We have um, our renovation is planned to be complete in August. And I just want to end by having a shout out to the Seashell Foundation. It's, they have been funding these upgrades and have been wonderful partners, and I just wanted to, to thank them and recognize them. I also wanted to let you know that over the past year at the hospital, we've hired an Indigenous patient navigator, and the focus of this role is to support us in providing more culturally safe care for our Indigenous patients. This role is important because it supports patients in many ways depending on the individual needs, from either linking them into community services or advocating for culturally appropriate care. I'm gonna shift now and talk about primary care. I know we had a question on primary care and we all know the importance, the importance of primary care and that it's top of mind for many folks, especially for individuals on the Sunshine Coast. We've been working with our partners um, the Sunshine Coast Division of Family Practice, the Seashell Nation, to expand access to primary care through the primary, Sunshine Coast Primary Care Network, with, which Yasmin spoke to earlier. The network is focused on attaching uh, the residents who don't have a primary care. So on the Sunshine Coast, there are about 7,000 people who do not have a primary care physician. And so the focus of the network is to attach um, to provide primary care by adding more family physicians. We're adding nurse practitioners, nurses, and allied health professionals, which includes pharmacy and social work, to provide uh, care in a more um, robust way. We're currently hiring for the primary ca care network positions. We've hired a nurse practitioner and a clinical counselor. We're also finalizing a lease right now on the physical space for this team to be where they'll be housed to see the patients. And I just wanted to share with you that if you are currently looking for a family doctor, the provincial government has created the Sunshine Coast Health Connection Registry. You can sign up to this registry and it's important to do that because it's here that family doctors and nurse practitioners in the community, it's where they go when they're available to accept new patients. So it's really important to register. I'm gonna talk now about long-term care. In late January, we helped hundreds of our residents from Shorncliff um, and Totem Lodge, along with our staff, move to Silverstone Long-Term Care Campus. We work very closely with Trellis who's the operator of Silverstone, throughout the move-in to ensure residents moving into the new home felt supported and that we could quickly address issues along the way. The move to Silverstone has increased the number of long-term care beds on the Sunshine Coast by 20, including six additional special care beds that will provide safe um, care for residents who need extra support like those with advanced dementia. And also there's a adult day program at Silverstone. We worked very collaboratively with the Sunshine Coast Hospice Society and Trellis to secure four interim hospice beds at Silverstone while we work with the Sunshine Coast Hospice Society on the longer term hospice plan. 
And I wanted to um, speak about um, what happens next for Shorncliffe and Totem, because I know it's been top of mind for uh, lots of folks in the community. So VCH is currently working on an external engine with an external engineering firm to conduct technical assessments of both the buildings. The assessment of Shorncliffe is still underway, but we have received the assessment for Totem. And it ind indicates to us that there are opportunities to invest in upgrades that can extend the life of the building. We're currently exploring options for future services that can be housed in the building, including looking at mental health and substance use care. Um, following the completion of the technical assessments, we will be working with staff, uh, community partners, government, and our nation to align what our options are for the facility with the local priorities for the community. Mental health and substance use, I'm just going to talk about some of the supports in the community. I want to first acknowledge um, the devastating toxic drug crisis and just share our um, sincere support uh, for those in the community who have lost loved ones. There is a lot of work underway locally and across the province to address the crisis. In February, we launched a low barrier recovery support program that we are expanding in phases over this calendar year, 2024. The program is for adults who use substances and are interested in recovery. It's free. It does not exclude people who are struggling with their substance use. It currently runs out of a community space in Seashelt four days a week. People can access the service by um, getting connected through our mental health and substance use intake at the Seashell Hospital or through the Opioid Agonist Treatment Clinic. We know there are youth struggling with mental health and substance use in, on the Sunshine Coast, as we heard from one of our callers. The Sunshine Coast Youth Program was established to support youth ages 12 to 24 who are struggling with mental health and substance use. The program offers support to youth who visit the Seashelt Hospital Emergency Department, as well as those we connect with through outreach through uh, nearby schools or those who are precariously housed. I, I wanted to talk about older adult mental health. We've been expanding our older adult mental health team. We've recently moved them to a larger and a new location at Trito Square and Seashelf, which means it's an easier um, access for seniors. We have been expanding the team and we've been able to expand the range of services now to have weekly program, weekly programming both in Seashelf and in Gibson. Um, to offer more accessible opioid agonist treatment services to clients in Pender Harbor. We've been running an uh, in-person clinic in that community once a month. We recognize there are transportation challenges when traveling to Seashelt's clinic, and this option, um, as well as the Lighthouse Virtual Substance Use Care Clinic, um, really try to make services more accessible um, to both the med to access support, medication, and and treatment. Um, these are just some of the services uh, that we're trying to offer and expand for mental health. I just wanted to touch briefly on a couple more items. One is the regenerative farm. We are in a partnership with the Seashell Nation and the Salish Sea Regenerative Farm Society to convert the land next to the hospital into a regenerative farm. Focus is to access um, nutritious food, uh, especially, and, and use that food at the hospital. We're very proud of this partnership. It's providing local sustainable food sources to the patients, and it's also allowing us to restore the land. And just the last thing I wanted to talk a little bit about was recruitment. We know that that's a challenge and, and folks are concerned about recruitment. It's a challenge across the country. Um, what we're doing now is trying to offer some incentives like temporary housing. And I just wanted to share that in 2022, we hired 107 staff specifically for Seashelt. And in 2023, 105 staff. So this is across our disciplines. 
And just last week, the government announced a new program to provide a $20,000 incentive for nurses who serve rural and remote communities. And I think this will be critical to us in helping with recruitment. So I just wanted to thank everyone for their time and giving me an opportunity to share, and I'll turn it back to Dr. Ballas. Thanks so much, Darlene. Um, a lot of really wonderful things going on with, and just want to reflect back on the foundation and the volunteers that that's helped um, help us with all these programs. So thank you so much. What I'm going to do now is um, just back us up a little bit because I skipped over the second poll question, which came after Dr. Kiketla's presentation. So this is a test for all of us to make sure we remember what Dr. Kiketla told us. And so the poll question is, of the public health priorities on the South Sunshine Coast, which is the most urgent and important for you? Press one for respiratory illnesses and immunization. Press two for toxic drug crisis. Press three for preparing and responding to the impacts of climate change and extreme weather. So again, the question is, in terms of the public health priorities that Dr. Kaketla talked to us about, which is the most urgent and important for you? Press one for respiratory illnesses and immunization. Press two for toxic drug crisis. Press three for preparing and responding to the impacts of climate change and extreme weather. So while you're thinking about that, just want to remind you if you have a question that you want to ask, because we're going to move into the, the question period, um, star three on your phone. You press star three at any time on your phone. Doesn't matter if someone's speaking. It will take you to the operator and you'll be put in the queue and you can indicate whether you want to, um, you want to ask the question or you want me to read it out. We've already had some great questions tonight. Okay, so the results of our poll. Wow, this is really interesting. So, respiratory illnesses and immunization, 29%. Drug crisis, 29%. And impacts of climate change, 42%. So, I think I could see Dr. Daly, who wrote the report recently on the climate change. And, and we all know that the Sunshine Coast is is impacted by climate change. So really happy, happy to have all those really important priorities for so many people. Thank you so much. So what we're going to do is actually probably do another poll. Um, oh, no, we'll do that later. How about that? We'll do that later. Do you have one? Let me just have a look here. I think we're good. So now we have a chance to have you, we have another 25 minutes for you to ask a range of questions. Um, and so I'm just going to open it up for questions. And while I'm waiting for that, I'm, I'm just going to ask Darlene, you know, we, we talked about, you and I talked about the other day about the preventive complex care home health program. And I wonder if you just want to talk about that while I'm waiting for the questions to come in. Sure. I'll start and then uh, Maria will add in what I missed. So Preventative complex care, I have some notes and I wanna just make sure I get it right for, for when I'm sharing it to the public. Um, preventative complex care is, is work we're trying to do to really expand the services in the community and to wrap services around um, individuals in the community in a more robust way. We know that individuals, when they can, prefer to be at home. And when they're in the hospital, we try, we try as best to send them home when we can. And this is really a way to wrap services around them and to actually not only wrap nursing services, but the whole team of services, as well as to have outreach um, by our primary care physicians. And I don't know, Marie, if there's anything you'd like to add, but we're doing this. Um, I'll just add before I hand to Marie that we're doing this in Vancouver, on the North Shore, and in Richmond. And we, did, we felt it was really important to have one rural community as a pilot or as an area to start. And we really wanted to use, um, to do that for, um, to have Seashelt as our rural community. Great. 
Thank you, Darlene. And I would love to just add a few words. So it's, it is, um, you know, we recognize how things are a little different in our rural communities often. And so to be able to really develop this with that rural lens and um, look at how we can better serve those very complex um, patients in their homes. I can, I'm happy to report that we've already hired our uh, leader for this great work and um, Dr. Baxter, our associate medical director, is working with our physicians as we develop a plan um, to really um, uh, be able to meet that physician component of this program. We're also going to be hiring two specific nurses um, to have as case managers and really looking at those in the highest need for very concentrated additional services. So it's very exciting. We're under early development um, uh, days and just really, um, for the lack of a better word, ruralizing this model. And um, it's, very, it's very exciting um, as, we, uh, as we move forward. Thanks, Marie. Um, so we've got a question from Don. Don, uh, why don't you ask your question? Hi. Um, well, a lot of my question has already been answered. It was regards to nurse practitioners and the the help with uh, resources devoted to helping maybe training and uh, accommodating them in the community. So could I change my question then? Is it okay? Sure. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, my wife's been on a, the list from the very beginning for the uh, for a doctor, find a doctor, when her doctor told her that he would be leaving the community and there was not a plan to provide her with another doctor at, at, the, uh, cl at the clinic. So uh, my question is, is the list being maintained in order of the people that signed up or is it actually being screened and, and, uh, and used uh, as, as it's, uh, you know, appropriate for the for the, the uh, potential, I guess, new doctors. Uh, it, because this, my wife has not received any communication and she signed up for it like right away when it first came out. Um, and maybe contact would be a good thing if you contacted people to give them an update so they know they're still, uh, they, they're, somebody does care about them. Yeah, those are those are really good questions, Don. It's good to have feedback on that new provincial registry. Yasmin, do you do you want to speak to it at all, or um, just to say that the list is being kept updated? So what's happening right now is that primary care providers have to go in and they have to register who their patients are, so that we're so that we know how many how much space they have to take on more patients. But we also then can look and see who has a doctor um, versus who we're attaching so that we're not double counting people, right? So they're keeping their list updated. And I think that the plan is that now that you're getting more providers in Seashelf, then they are given, they're given a list and they go through that list. So, it's the, so the 811 number, the registry, gives the doctors the list, the list or that list then calls people. Um, so I think there's two things. One is your feedback is really helpful that um, I will give back to the 811 registry is that they need to get back to people who register just to give an update on where things are at and what's happening in their community. So I will provide that feedback. And the second thing is to say that um, that it's the registry that gives the doctors the list, not the doctors who choose who they want off the list. If that, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much, Yasmin. Thanks, Dawn. Um, our next one is from Kathleen. Kathleen, go ahead and ask your question. I, yours is my most favorite question of the whole night, I think. Oh, well, um, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I, I really feel that this is an extreme move on my part, but um, I just don't seem to be making any progress at all trying to um, secure a position at the Seashell Hospital Emergency. Um, uh, just for the rest of the party. Uh, first of all, I did want to acknowledge the Seashell people and the gift of the hospital that they have as well. That's very important to me. Um, but uh, I am a nurse. I've just moved from Victoria to Seashells. I've moved here to be with my 90-year-old father. Um, right now, he does very well at home, but I'm here to make sure that he stays in his own home. And um, uh, I have over 30 years critical care experience uh, with Island Health. I have worked in the Seashell Hospital in both the emergency and in the ICU. 
Um, I've done a bit of uh, uh, CSO work there as well when I was there in 2019-2020. At the time, I left Seashell to go back to Victoria to do my master's, and I was successful. I have my master's leadership health now. Um, last year, I worked over 1,390 hours with Island Health. I worked 190 hours with Camosun College. That's all on my resume. Um, just this last week, I updated my ACLS, my BLS, um, uh, you know, all of my qualifications are up to date. My BCA, everything is in standing. And I can't get anybody to respond to me. I've sent a letter, email to uh, who I believe to be the site director, um, and I don't want to be using names or anything, at Seashell eight days ago. No one's getting back to me. When I go to the recruitment site, you cannot talk to a person. All you can do is leave a message. No one will talk to you. No one will call you back. There must be something wrong with my application. It says that they will only be contacting candidates who meet or exceed the qualifications. Very humbly, that's me. Hey. I meet and exceed these okay. qualifications. Emergency room, ICU, um, recovery room, or site operations, you know. And I, I, I'm just pleading with you could you please connect me with somebody so that I can give services back to this community that I care very much about both of my parents including my mother have been patients there they saved my father's life in a very dramatic fashion uh, uh, four years ago um, my mother died at home but after being there after receiving excellence of care and um, I'm very eager to participate and contribute to this hospital here i just I, I, i'm just flabbergasted and, and i'm at i'm at i'm at the end of my rope i don't know who to contact all right well thank you so much kathleen i'm so sorry that it's been such a difficult time to get a call back but i i'm just going to pass that to marie uh Dipero. go ahead marie Hi, Kathleen. Thank you. I am so happy you called in this evening. And I am the operation director for the entire Sunshine Coast. Um, and I would love to have the opportunity to have a conversation with you. So if you could just um, either you can come to the administration um, area of the hospital and we can connect in and set up a time um, and um, and I would love to have a conversation with you. So, and I am so sorry it's been so difficult for you to connect in, but I would love to have a conversation. So maybe Marie, if Kathleen wants to phone the operator too, yep. star three, you can we can connect you two up um, behind the scenes. How about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Really appreciate it. We need we need nurses. Um, so our next. One uh, question is from Darnelda, and um, this was a pre-submitted one. Plans were talked about with regards to renovating the operating room so that we would have two that could be used at the same time. What is the status of that plan? Operating rooms are really important for access to surgery. So maybe I'll, I'll pass that one to Marie as well. Yep, thank you, and thanks, Darnelda. Um, I'm really pleased to let you know that we actually do currently have two operating rooms that are available and they are being used concurrently. Last year, we were able to expand our services, um, which was included, you know, securing additional hours that we needed to support both of those rooms. And it also included hiring additional staff so that we could run both of those concurrently. And um, we're currently running them nine hours a day from Monday to Friday. So uh, good news, good news in being able to, to expand our services for the Sunshine Coast. Great, thanks so much, Marie. And just to remind everyone, if you want to ask a question, push star three on your phone and you'll be connected to the operator. So we've got a question from Sarah wants it to be read, how will you fix the long-term care bed shortage? I'm going to pass that over to Darlene. So I, I think there's a couple of, I'm going to start and then I might. Yeah. Um, um, so I think there's a couple of things we have done. So firstly, thank you for the question. 
we know that with the opening of Silverstone and Trellis, we have added 20 beds. It's not, it doesn't close the gap, but it has added 20 beds for the Sunshine Coast. We've done work and we'll make sure that work is aligned with the master planning to look at the need. And, we, and we've done a lot of this work to understand the needs within the community. And now what we're looking at is looking at opportunities for different solutions that maybe aren't just large bills. And we're doing that because I think we know across the Sunshine Coast, there's maybe opportunities to have smaller um, long-term care facilities that will allow us to, in a more expedited fashion, close the gap and also provide care um, to individuals for long-term care and assisted living closer in their own community. And I know that work is started and I know the planning for it is started and maybe I I don't know if Fernando's on, if he would like to just add a little bit about what we're looking at for these opportunities. Yeah, thanks, Go ahead, Fernando, and just introduce yourself. That'd be terrific. Sure, you bet. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Fernando Pico. I'm Chief Financial Officer and VP of Partnerships for Vancouver Coastal. Very happy to be here, and uh, great. Thank you for all the questions. What Darlene's is describing is, you know, when we build you know, our long-term care homes, you know, the big ones with 100-plus beds take a long time to build and can be very expensive. Um, and you need a lot of land sometimes to do those things. So one, one of the uh, options that we're looking at is something we call small care homes. So keeping our eye out for opportunities that are small in nature, maybe 8, 10, 12, 14 bed large homes that we could convert um, into long-term care um, facilities for an appropriate cohorted amount of people as a strategy to kind of get at some of these um, shortages of beds at a much faster rate. And building long, uh, large institutions. Great, thanks a lot, Fernando. And just um, want to, you know, put in a plug for the work that Fernando is doing across the organization and clearly in the coastal community to try and help us and, you know, help uh, work with the ministry to enable some new, more expedited solutions to the gaps in long-term care. So, really appreciate your work, Fernando. And I just want to put in a plug for the auxiliary um, at the Seashell Hospital. They they do a remarkable job, and they're an incredible group of volunteers raising money for the hospital and helping take care of patients. So I just really want to appreciate any auxiliary members who are in the audience tonight. And if they're not, but you know who they are, please pass it on how much the board of VCH appreciates their work. So we have David. Um, David, you've got a question. Fire away. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I think Darlene has has touched on this, but I um, both my wife and, and myself have had opportunity to spend uh, some time in the emergency ward. Myself, uh, I was in there for two and a half days in emergency, and it appeared to me during that time that the, there was. A, a huge or, or a large percentage of the of the people in eMERGE had either mental health or drug addiction issues uh, that were consuming a huge amount of time by the staff. And are there any, in the long-term, short-term plans, any um, uh, plans to um, have a separate sort of area or ward that, that that could be taken care of for people with with uh, uh, mental illnesses or or that were do, going through withdrawals because it was it was just it, the the our it, it appears to me that our uh, emergency ward in um, the Seashell Hospital is in crisis because of it. And I have to, having spent time in there, give the staff just no amount of praise and be awarded them for the the what they tolerate by these people with mental illnesses and drug addictions. So, Darlene, could you? Uh, and, and I think you've elaborated, but it would be certainly nice in long-term and short-term plans to deal with those um, people with those issues because they need help. Uh, to be dealt with sort of in a separate section or something. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thanks so much, David. Go ahead, Darlene. 
So the first thing I will say is thank you for the question. And I would agree with you is there's no, um, we cannot thank the staff and the medical staff of the hospital enough for all the hard work. It is at times very challenging because they're doing their work in a space that's quite congested with lots of varying needs like you described, right? Medical and mental health all combined. So this immediate renovation will provide a little bit of a relief. It is going to have some dedicated space and dedicated room for caring for patients who present with mental health and substance use. But it is just, an, a, it, it, we would say it's a little bit of immediate support. And as we go through, we know that the emergency needs to be larger, the emergency department. And so as we go through the master planning exercise, we will be able to understand what it is we need across the site, but emergency being the front door for everyone. So we, how we accommodate that. And I'll just share with you that on the North Shore, we did we did an emergency renovation and we created a, a space within our emergency called the um, Psychiatric Emergency Assessment and Treatment. And it is, uh, it's part of emergency, but it is separated to care for the special needs of those who present with mental health and substance use. It's a co-model um, of care between emergency department and mental health. And it has made a tremendous difference for all of the patients, but particularly for this group of patients and for the staff and working in partnership in the care. So that will be the approach we look to going forward as we do our master planning and as we do the clinical planning to make sure that we're caring for the group. So I really appreciate it, the question and the opportunity to give you that feedback. And, and maybe I can just add in, Darlene, and you can jump in if I'm on the wrong track, but we talked a little bit earlier about Foundry. Um, you know, Foundry is an incredible program for youth to kind of, to engage with us and start to get some some care addressing their various issues earlier on so they don't end up in emergency. Um, we are, we are as we said, looking at the, the um, Codem and Shorncliffe to see, is there anything in mental health and substance use we can, we can do in there? That would be one of the areas that we may be able to, again, provide some other space for interactions and care that would potentially preclude them having to go to an emergency. And, and you know, finally, I think that, um, as I said, the road to recovery, like there are going to be investments as we start to get clear on how that program is going to roll out across the province, large and small communities, um, that also will likely make a difference. So just really want to highlight that. And, you know, that First Nations Health Authority is also working with the nations around the province and in some cases putting resources on their lands, in their communities to help with their primary care as well in this area of care. So we're all working together to try and create more capacity and resources for our public. So thanks so much for a really important question, David. Um, we've got a question from Aaron. What is required to classify a hospital as urban rather than rural? Would this designation benefit Seashell Hospital? And maybe I can take that one. I was just discussing sort of how we classify and tier our hospitals in the province, the, the, the ministry uses a fairly simple classification system, and it's really based on the size of the community and which dictates the size of the hospital. And so we go from the teaching, the major teaching hospitals to the large communities, the medium sized communities in the province, and then the small ones. And at this point, Seychelles is on the medium size. Um, and so that's where we would fall in the classification. And I, I think that we know that our our small and medium-sized communities are growing all the time, and that's why it's so important to do a master plan and to to look forward and see what we need, how the needs of our public is, um, you know, are changing. And so, I think that um, you know that's that's where we sit. And and as we look at the future, we you know you never know. Uh, we may end up in a in a different level of hospital, but that will dictate. Uh, the kinds of services that we're able to provide, the kinds of resources that we'll get from the government. And it will be a, you know, a really interesting and exciting process to come up with that final plan. So we've got um, another five minutes. 
and just want to see if anyone has any last question, push star three. Um, and, you know, if if not, I, oh, here we've got uh, Marina. So Marina, you have a question, please go ahead. Yes, yes, hello, thank you uh, for having this information session and allowing community involvement. Um, yeah, this is going to the question of mental health and uh, the resources that could be put in place before people end up having to seek the crisis help from emergency rooms. I know a lot of people who cannot afford to see counselors or psychiatrists or psychologists, I should say. And I hear that there's like one or two psychiatrists on the coast. Um, what is uh, the Vancouver Coastal Health going to do about providing more counseling um, that's free of charge to people who really need it? Um, yes, that's essentially my question. Thank you. That's great. It's a really good question, Marina. I think, you know, accessing that care, and because not everyone needs to see a psychiatrist, but they, they still need some support. So maybe I'll turn that to Marie. Hi, Maria. Thank you for that question. Um, I, I have really good news. Um, we have just recently hired a counselor under the umbrella of funding that came to us from the province through the um, primary care network. And we are, we are also offering um, services uh, through our mental health and substance use programming. Uh, here through Vancouver Coastal, and so as we're building, as we're we're beginning to recruit and and build services through our PCN, um, that is certainly one of the things that has been identified as a real need on the Sunshine Coast. Um, so if you you want to connect in, we can make sure that uh, you have some information and you can connect in with me and um, I can really support and help direct you or anybody else who's interested in accessing services um, uh, as we expand them on the, uh, on the coast here. And you're muted. Sorry, thanks so much, uh, Marie, and thanks for the question, Marina really important one. We're, we're actually at time now, and I really just want to take the opportunity to um, thank all of you for spending part of your evening with us. It's, it's really informative and helpful for us to have a chance to talk to our community um, in all the various areas that Vancouver Coastal has responsibility. I want to really thank our speakers for their updates and all of our staff who work in Seashell, Gibsons, and the South Sunshine Coast region, Pender Harbor, wherever you are, how much we appreciate you working and delivering the best care possible. And I, I want to thank our board. Um, we have a number of board members on here with us tonight, and they are so committed for, you know, to this organization and to, to helping represent the voice of our public. Um, with in all the many discussions we have with our senior team and our senior staff. So thank you to our board directors and, you know, most importantly, thank you to the community, your, your support, um, your willingness to come and engage with us and ask questions and tell us your good and bad experiences and your suggestions, your ideas it makes a huge difference for us. And we really appreciate it. And as I see, I'm, I'm going to go back to Kathleen and say, well, I hope, that you're feeling good about staying on the Sunshine Coast. There's lots of things coming along and moving and we are open. We will be back to you with another open board forum, you know, in the not too distant future. And, you know, our, our desire is to stay in touch with you, whether it's through our master planning process, the, the work we'll do around Cliff and Totem and what we can do there to meet your needs and do a better, you know, do an ever, better job for, you know, addressing the issues that you have in terms of your health and the health of your families. So thank you so much. Thank you to Hawes, Rochelle Jones, and the Chassal Nation. Really appreciate your partnership. Thank you to all of you out there and all of our staff. And 
I look forward to seeing you at, or hearing you from you at another time. So I declare this meeting adjourned and wish all of you a good night. Thank you so much.